This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. So our, our last keynote address for the day continues the themes of the panels on women's voices and is dedicated to Denise Levitor. Our speaker is Professor Dana Green. Dana is currently Dean Emerita of Emory University. She has been for many years Professor of History at Oxford College, Emory University, and until 2008, Executive Director of Aquinas Centre for Theology. Dana was first trained as an historian and subsequently combined her interest in history with her love for literature and the spiritual life. She is best known for her biographies and editions of the works of remarkable and courageous women from different religious traditions. The American Quaker and religious reformer Lucrezia Mott, the Unitarian Olympia Brown, who was the first woman to graduate from a theological school, as well as becoming the first full-time ordained minister. The Anglican Evelyn Underhill, of whom Dana edited the notebooks and wrote a biography, the Catholic writer, publisher, and speaker, Maisie Ward, and the Roman Catholic convert, Edith Stein. Dana has just completed a biography of Denise Levitov for the University of Illinois Press. Her keynote lecture is entitled, Denise Levitov, Poetry as a Way to Prayer. Thank you, Dana. for provoking us so wonderfully today. It's been, it's been wonderful, a real feast, I think. Uh, and I hope to contribute to that feast, and I think it's important to do that right at this moment because we're soon going to have wine, and it's always best to have a little something in your stomach uh, before um, you absorb that uh, alcohol, which is yet to come. <clears throat> I think a few disclaimers are in order. <clears throat> I'm not a poet or a literary critic, not a theologian or a historian of spirituality, not a philosopher, but as Francesca uh, just mentioned, a biographer, an occupation which has not always been in the best repute. <clears throat> Biographers have been called hyenas, busybodies, Judases, accused of a higher form of cannibalism, and of giving a new fear to death. <laughs> but I have engaged with this genre because I'm convinced that lives matter, both their living and their telling. Biography, like all artistic writing, brings with it a reward. As Keats said, writing is a veil of soul-making, and the more ancient Marie of the Incarnation claimed that writing teaches us our mysteries, I found both to be true. What I have learned in the process of writing biography is that this humanistic genre might be able to do in the 21st century what hagiography can no longer convincingly do. It can, through diligent research, reconstruct a life and show in the last analysis that the self is ultimately elusive, a mystery, and a and construction which points beyond itself to some other mystery. I'm fortunate to have had a biographical subject, Denise Levertov, who was a poet who spent her life in search of the ineffable. In writing her biography, my pleasure has been double, to explore a life and to be immersed in poetry simultaneously. <laughs> as a sparse form of literature steeped in metaphor, imagery, using rhythm and repetition, in our perilous times, poetry might seem as useless as biography. But it was W.H. Auden who said that poetry makes nothing happen, and William Carlos Williams forwarding that notion aloud that it's difficult to get the news from poems 
Yet men and women die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. Like biography, poetry matters, particularly in our times, because the sources of our inspiration and wonderment seem so scarce. Poetry saves us from history, from current events. Like biography, poetry inspires and causes us to reflect on the human condition in all of its diverse aspects. My claim tonight is that poetry, as understood by Levertov, may do even more. It may be a practice which can prepare us to pray. Poetry may be, as the Edwardian Evelyn Underhill attested, the royal banner that goes before prayer and can be trusted as an ally. It may be precursor of what Simone Weil defines as prayer, namely paying attention to God. I have made my disclaimers about being a biographer to warn you of my slant on tonight's topic, but also to indicate that biography, too, might share some of the continuities with poetry and prayer that I'll enumerate. Levertov claimed that both poetry and prayer are forms of primary speech that derive from an original primitive Ur language, that both are forms of primordial discourse of the self with the other. Both confront us with being, and in a less obvious way, biography, the telling of a life, confronts us with being as well, and while it may not begin in wonder, a life can lead, can end, and reconfirm a kind of primary wonder. Denise Levertov, unlike most poets, wrote both poems and poetics, and as a consequence, she offers us unique insight into her understanding of the craft itself and her vocation. My effort will be to mine her life as well as her text in order to illustrate her contribution to an understanding of poet, poetry and how it relates to and is different from prayer. Levertov belongs to you, the, our English uh, participants. She was Essex born and shaped by the English countryside and her solitary childhood here. But she also belongs to us on the other side of the Atlantic, having come to America when she was 26 years old and later naturalized as a citizen. She claimed nonetheless to belong neither to England nor to America, and would, I think, find it ironic that just this year the United States Postal Service has honored her with a commemorative stamp, and that the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. has included her in their upcoming exhibit on American Poets. To her lights, she was an air plant, that's her word, a pilgrim belonging nowhere. The only descriptor she allowed was one she gave herself, poet in the world. If she had a home, she said, it was language itself, what she called her Jerusalem. I want to begin by giving a very brief pricey of Levertov's life, although here again she would deny that her life mattered very much. Her motto might have been Ars Longa, Vita Brevis. What was important to her was her work, her more than 20 books of poetry, including lyric, nature, political, and religious poems, five volumes of essays on poets and poetics. And yet Levertov's Solomonic choice of work over life is refuted by her own statements she insisted that everything she wrote came from her own life experience. I have always written out of my own experience. I have always tended to reflect in my poems the places and experiences of my own life. She called her poems testimonies of lived life and acknowledged that both life and poetry fade, wilt, and shrink when they are divorced. There is nothing shrinking, wilting, or fading about either Levitoff's life or work, engaged as she was with the great issues of the second half of the 20th century. And yet she maintained 
that it was the inner life which was the most important area for exploration. In her essays and poetry, in her voluminous notebooks, diaries, and letters, she left ample evidences of that inner life. Given this voluminous material, I attempted to plumb her inner life as best as possible, surrounding her mystery, which could only be pointed to, not fully known to either me or to her. Given that Levertov's life and work may not be well known to everyone here tonight, I want to take a few moments uh, to comment about the shape of her 74 years. She was born in Ilford, in 1923, the youngest daughter of a Russian Hasidic Jew who converted to Christianity and subsequently became an Anglican priest and scholar of religion, and a Welsh mother, a painter, an avid gardener, a pointer-outer, as Levertov called her, who um, Denise herself always credited with fostering her poetic vocation. Both Paul Philip Levertov, that's his Christian name, and Beatrice Spooner Jones Levertov were orphans and exiles. He was disowned by his Russian Jewish family when he became a Christian, and Beatrice lost both her parents at a young age. Through her father's ancestral line, Denise Levertov was related to the 18th century founder of Hapad, Hebat, an offshoot of Hasidim, um, known as the Rave of Northern White Russia and through her mother to the Welsh Methodist tailor and poet Angle Malt Jones of Mould. Levertov's self-narrative was that she was destined to be a poet, given that there was what she called a taut line between these illustrious ancestors and herself. At age five, she claimed to have written her first poem, and by 12, she knew she was a poet. Full of self-confidence, she sent off at age 12 a clutch of poems to T.S. Eliot, then editor of Criterion, who encouraged her to keep on writing. He said he wasn't going to publish any of this stuff, that it would embarrass her later in her life. <clears throat> her solitary life and the absence of any formal schooling, she never went to school, the influence of a literate and scholarly family, freedom to roam the countryside and haunt museums alone, allowed her time for reflection. Her first poem was published when she was 17, and at 23, she could boast of a first book of poetry. She was inspired in her vocation by writer Maria Rilke, from whom she absorbed a sense of being a pilgrim, the importance of inner experience and the need for solitude. From Keats, Wordsworth, and Tennyson, she learned her craft, and from Cezanne, with his continual repetition in painting uh, Mount St. Victor, inspired persistence in her vocation. During the Second World War, she worked in hospitals as an aide, and then traveling in post-war Europe, she met and married an American GI, Mitchell Goodman, moved to New York City, where she gave birth to a son. During the 1950s, the Goodmans lived a bohemian, and peripatetic life, moving from New York to Provence to Mexico and back to Greenwich Village. Their finances were meager, and Libertal felt her creativity was stultifying. But during this period, she and Goodman read Buber, Martin Buber, and she was encouraged by William Carlos Williams and became associated with the so-called Black Mountain poets, especially Charles Olson, Robert Duncan, and Robert Creeley. In the early 1960s, Levertov taught at a variety of colleges and universities, gave readings throughout the United States, and began to reflect on her craft. She was at that point the author of six volumes of poetry. But the deepening engagement of the United States in war in Vietnam swept her and Goodman up into the anti-war movement, which dominated their lives for almost a decade. Levertov's activism derived from her poetic vocation itself. As poet in the world, she believed she had a prophetic role, as she said, to awaken sleepers. She was intellectually and emotionally consumed by the anti-war effort. She traveled to Moscow in 1970, this is at the heart of the war, to Hanoi in 1973, she was arrested several times, 
and encouraged her students and readers to resist the war. The Federal Bureau of Investigation kept a file on her and her husband. The consequences of this preoccupation with war frayed Levertov's psyche and exacerbated problems in her already fragile marriage. By war's end, she filed for divorce, terminated and terminated her precious friendship with Robert Duncan, whom she had claimed as her mentor. Fearing the loss of her poetic sight, she wrote metaphorically that a cataract had formed over her inner eye. By the late 1970s, there was a very evident turning in Levertov's life. From about age 13, she insisted she was an agnostic as regards faith, and certainly her artistic friends were either a-religious or anti-religious, as was her husband. But with her divorce finalized, the death of her devoutly religious yet prudish mother, and her own psychic need, Levertov evidenced a need for realignment. It was in the process of writing poems that she experienced a shift from full-scale religious doubt to an openness to some kind of belief. While her poetry continued to reflect engagement with the world, concern for environmental destruction, unjust wars, Latin American militarism, senseless murders, exploitation of the poor, some religious themes began to appear in her work. For about 10 years, she explored all kinds of Christian affiliations. But after moving to the Pacific Northwest eight years before her death, she claimed, and this is the way she describes it, to throw in her lot with the likes of, and she chose these people specifically, Thomas Merton, Dorothy Day, and Oscar Romero. She brought her reservations with her, always insisting she was a Christian, but an unorthodox one. It was at this a same point that she came to understand that she wanted to write a different kind of poetry. More and more, she wrote, what I saw is a poetry that, while it does not attempt to ignore or deny the ocean of crisis in which we swim, is itself on pilgrimage, as it were, in search of, significant, of a significance underneath and beyond the succession of temporal events, a poetry which attests to a deep spiritual longing. The poet's goal, she wrote, she wrote, is to live with the door of one's life open to the transcendent, to the numinous. Levertov died in 1997, leaving behind a body of work, her testimonies of lived life, which she hoped would endure. In her first book of poems, entitled The Double Image, uh, published in 1946, Levertov sets out the major theme of her work, the exploration of both the wonder and the brokenness of life, as she put it, its fears and possibilities. She saw life double. This double image was poignantly explored. Joy is real, she wrote. Torture is real. We strain to make a bridge between them, and we fail or almost fail. Early on, Levertov maintained that there was an order in reality, and that the task of the poet was to discover that order and communicate it. Poems are, quote, analogies, resemblances, natural allegories of that order. I believe, she wrote, Poets are instruments on which the power of poetry plays, but they're also makers, craftsmen. It is given to the seer to see, but it is then his, and she uses throughout male uh, pronouns, his responsibility to communicate what he sees, and they who cannot see, so that they who cannot see may see, since we are members all one of another. Levertov had many mentors, living and dead. Three early ones were Hopkins, George Mary Hopkins, Rilke, and Keats. All of them influenced her craft and her commitment to poetic vocation. She believed that what the poet is after is the inscape of the thing, its uh, intrinsic inner form. Inscape is this term, as we know, borrowed from Hopkins, 
was being in the thing itself, manifestation of incarnation. It was discovered through the capacity of attention. It was Rilke who strengthened her commitment to paying attention, the primary requisite of the poetic life. She wrote of him, she, she quotes him, if a thing, this is Rilke, if a thing is to speak to you, you must for a certain time regard it as the only thing that exists, the unique phenomenon that your diligent and exclusive love has placed at the center of the universe, something that the angels serve that very day upon that matchless spot. Later, in describing the process of poem making, Levertov gives priority to reverence and attention. She writes, from reverence for life to attention to life, from attention to life to the poet's highly developed seeing and hearing, and from seeing and hearing to the discovery and revelation of form, and then from form to song. In one of her early poems, she playfully describes how the poet works, analogizing this process to canine behavior. She writes, let us go much as the dog goes, intently hazard, dancing, edgewise. There's nothing the dog disdains on his way. Nevertheless, he keeps moving, changing, pace and approach, but not direction, every step and arrival. This method results in a poem which transports the reader overland to a magical place, the islands, hence the poem's title, Overland to the Islands. Only once does Levertov analogize the poet to the pooch. More frequently, the poet is for her pilgrim, one who is open, expansive, engaged on a journey to some transcendent place. Levertov describes the poem as a temple, a place in which epiphanies and communions take place. There the poet, who she calls priest, sees and then become, because he sees, he communicates, making him prophet, one who awakens sleepers. Borrowing from Keats's notion of negative capability, she insists that what is required of the poet is a profound capacity for receptivity, what she calls a contemplation. She writes, as the poet stands open mouth in the temple of life, contemplating his experience, there comes to him first the words of the poem, the words which are to be his way into the poem. Contemplation is not merely observing the thing, but doing this in what she calls the presence of a god, small g. By this she means the poet's individual experience is transformed, made into something which is universal. The result, the poem, is what she calls an autonomous structure, a new independent reality accessible to others. Central to poetic creation, and actually to Levertov, for Levertov, all artistic expression is the faculty of imagination, a quality she continues to reflect on over the course of her life. She defined imagination first as the human capacity which synergizes intellect, emotion, and instinct, and which is key to both poetic creation and compassion. She wrote, <clears throat> the imagination of what it is to be those other forms of life that want to live, and by this she means both human forms and natural forms, is the only way to recognition, and it is that imaginative recognition that brings compassion to birth. Man's capacity for evil, then, is less positive capacity for all of its horrendous activity than a failure to develop man's most human function, the imagination to its fullest, and consequently a failure to develop compassion. It was precisely such reasoning that led Levertov the poet to become Levertov the social activist. 
She was clear about the order of this developing. And yet it would be exactly this tension between being poet and compassionate prophet which would bring her to her nadar in the late 1960s. <clears throat> Later, Levertov identified imagination as a perceptive organ, one that penetrates through the meaning of uh, through the meaning of appearances to being itself. And later still, she suggests that imagination can lift affliction by illuminating it and making it more comprehensible, separating the affliction from the self. Although Levertov would agree with Auden and Williams about poetry's inability to change history, she would attest with them that it can change the individual for history. In an interview, she said that poetry can increase a sense of living, of being alive, of enlarging, enlarging one's experience. She claimed that there is a kind of chemical change that takes place in a person when one reads poetry. Even if one forgets the poem afterward, the body, she says, doesn't forget. In one of her final essays, she wrote that poetry reveals the unity of the trembling web of being in what she calls these unprecedented times when the fate of this web of being hangs in precarious balance. Poetry helps one survive. It gives witness and like prophecy, it transforms experience and moves or and can move the receiver to new attitude. Poetry can stimulate the imagination, quicken a love of life, and help one find the energy to stop what she calls the accelerating tumble towards annihilation. Imagination, she later contends, was the faculty through which humans could apprehend mystery. And she adds that, quote, the celebration of mystery probably constitutes the most consistent theme of my poetry from the very beginning. Certainly her awareness of mystery was fueled by her father's Hasidic background and deepened by her reading of Buber. The inscape of Hopkins, the negative capability of Keats, the disinterested um, intensity of Rilke, each brought her closer to the fat apprehension of mystery. Her language attests to its presence she spoke of hymns and psalms, of pilgrimage and communion, of destiny, as poet, as priest, as poem, as temple, and praise as, quote, the irresistible impulse of the soul. Although she sometimes uses this religious language, in her early work, say, up through about the mid-1970s, mid she says, that this language, the meaning of this language is always literary and aesthetic, not religious. When asked to define religion, she said it was an impulse to the numinous, a response to the numinous. Quote, it's the impulse to kneel in wonder, the impulse to kiss the ground, the sense of awe, the felt presence of some mysterious force Force, whether it be what we call beauty, or perhaps just the sense of the unknown. And I don't mean unknown here in the sense of we don't know what the future will bring. She goes on, I mean the sense of newness, whether it's in a small stone or a large mountain. This wonderment and sense of awe was evident already in some of Levertov's early poems. I'm going to give some examples of this. In her poem, Matins, for example, she calls on marvelous truth in its many guises to confront us, quote, to dwell in our crowded hearts, our steaming bathrooms, kitchens full of things to be done, the ordinary streets. She petitions marvelous truth to thrust close your smile that we may know your terrible joy. And what is marvelous truth? It is what she calls the authentic. That's it. That's joy. It's always a recognition. The known appearing fully itself and more itself than one knew. In the poem, O Taste and See, 
she turns Wordsworth line, the world is too much with us, on its head, and claims instead that the world is not enough with us. She encourages us to taste and see the way through to the extraordinary world of marvelous truth and authenticity was to take it into oneself, to, quote, bite, savor, chew, swallow, transform it into our flesh. The way through to the vision was through engagement with life itself. She ends this collection of poems with three runes. Know your world. Know yourself. Know that if you would grow, go straight up or deep down. In the poem, The Thread, published in 1961, she speaks of her sense of being guided and led. Something is very gently, invisibly, silently pulling at me, a thread or net of threads finer than a cobweb and as elastic. But a stirring of wonder makes me catch my breath when I feel the tug of it when I thought it had loosened itself and gone. And in the remarkable poem, City Song, she, allude, she alludes to life's double image and to her apprehension of some blessing or mercy found not behind, but within reality itself. The killings continue each second Pain and misfortune extend themselves. Injustice is done knowingly, and the air bears the dust of decayed hopes. Yet I have seen, not behind, but within, within dull grief, blown grit, hideous concrete facades, another grief, a gleam as of a dew, an abode of mercy, having heard not behind but within a humming. Nothing was changed. All was revealed otherwise. Not that horror was not, not that the killings did not continue, not that I thought there would be no more despair, but that as if transparent, all disclosed, an otherness that was blessed, that was bliss, I saw paradise in the dust of the streets. By 1977, Levertov's life had changed through the deaths and estrangement of family members. The solidarity she once experienced in war resistance had passed. Now a woman alone, craving intimacy, she sought out many lovers with unsuccessful consequences. It was at that point in the process of writing a long experimental poem based on the structure of the mass that she experienced some kind of turning. This poem, The Mass for the Day of St. Thomas Didymus, was composed of a Kyrie, Gloria, Credo, Sanctus, Benedictus, and Agnus Dei, but it was her intent to make it an agnostic poem. The poem's stunning language dim star, spark of remote light, guttering candle, was reminiscent of her acidic heritage. The Kyrie opens with a petition to the deep remote unknown to have mercy on us because we live in terror of what it is to, uh, what is known and unknown. The Gloria follows praising the sun and the snow, the night and the day. The Credo attests to both belief and doubt. I believe the earth exists, and in each minim mote of its dust, the holy glow of thy candle, I believe and interpret my belief with doubt. I doubt and inter interrupt my doubt with belief. Be beloved, threatened world. The Sanctus is a great hosanna to the unknown, the unknowable, and the Benedictus a hymn of praise to the spirit, to all that is, all that which bears the spirit within it. This portion of the poem concludes with a statement of hope. The word chose to become flesh. 
in the blur of flesh, we bow baffled. In the concluding Agnus Day, Levertov presents the Lamb of God, the innocent, defenseless creature, the Lamb, as the one who takes away the sins of the world. She queries her readers, is it they who must hold this shivering God to their icy hearts? She rallies those who can respond, those who are yet human, to shield this defenseless lamb. So be it, come rag of pungent, quivering, dim star. Let's try if something human still can shield you, spark of remote light. Months after she spoke of how writing this poem changed her, when I arrived at the Agnes Day, I discovered myself to be in a different relationship to the material and to the liturgical form to which I had begun. The experience of writing the poem, the long swim through the waters of unknown depth, had been almost a conversion process. This process was gradual and would continue for another decade. Levertov began to shop around for liturgical communities in which she felt comfortable. At the same time, she began to develop her do-it-yourself theology. Ultimately, she decided to make what she called her Pascalian wager to live as a Christian in order she might become one. In 1989, she settled into the Catholic community in Seattle. It was a difficult decision, one she did not make lightly. She considered herself an unorthodox Christian, differing as she did on a number of issues, both theological and pastoral. She received direction from Franciscan and Jesuit clergy, made friends with the likes of Luke Tobin, Sister Luke Tobin, one of the few women who attended the Second Vatican Council. And in 1992, she made the spiritual exercise, which she found helpful. As a poet, she, was particular, she particularly resonated with how imagination was used in the exercises to conjure gospel events and the emphasis they placed on observing physical detail. In a later interview, she uh, said, I was really amazed at how close the exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola were to, to a poet or novelist imagining a scene. You focus your attention on some particular aspect of the life of Christ you try to compose that scene in your imagination. You place yourself there. It's, uh, if it's the Via Dolorosa, you, um, you have to ask yourself, are you one of the disciples? Or are you a passerby? Or are you a spectator that likes to watch from the side? You establish who you are and where you stand, and then you look and, at what you see. Beginning in early 1980s, Levertov began to write some poetry with explicitly Christian themes. She memorialized Cadman, the seventh century coward whose tongue was unlocked by an angel, earning him the designation of the first English poet. In the serving girl at Emmaus, she recounts the meeting of the Moorish kitchen girl and the Christ. And in Candlemas, she recalls the response of the aged Simeon, who when presented with the infant Jesus, knows with surety the meaning of this child. With certitude, Simeon opened ancient arms to infant light. Decades before the cross, the tomb, he knew new life. In the poem, This Day, Levertov affirms the nearness of mystery and alludes to the incarnation. God is in the dust, not sifted out from confusion. But it was her poems on Julian of Norwich that Levertov, it was in those poems that she was most revel revelatory. In those she undertakes consideration of several theological issues, the value of creation, the powerlessness of the evil in the face of good, the relationship between human suffering and God's mercy, the meaning of the life of Jesus, and the role of imagination in experiencing religious truth. In the poem on the theme of Julian, uh, chapter 20, uh, Levertov asks, why single out the agony of Christ? What is unique in his suffering? 
Others have suffered torture for a longer time. Julian's spirit leapt to the difference. She saw Jesus, one in with the Godhead, as opening him to the pain of all minds, all bodies, from first beginning to last day. He was king of grief, enduring within history the sum total of all anguish, every sorrow and desolation he saw and sorrowed in kinship. In her longer poem, The Showings, Levertov acknowledges the vast sweep of history in the heavens, but Julian asks that we consider the world as a little thing the size of the hazelnut lying in God's pierced palm. She does this in order to share the mystery she has been shown that all creation is held safe by God. This powerful image of consolation was given to Julian and shared with Levertov. In the second part of the showings, Levertov imagines the youth and adulthood of this anchoress. One audacious desire is Julian's, to have the five wounds of Christ. This she achieves by enacting metaphor in order for flesh to be known, made known to intellect, made known in bone and breath, God's agony, and not die. With this knowledge, Julian is able to laugh, to scorn evil, and to banish the dreaded fiend. She is glad with the most high inward happiness. Julian, the one who clung to joy in the midst of agony, the one who, like an acrobat, fiercely and with the certainty of infinite mercy, witnessed the desire to share her knowledge of Christ's meaning. Love was his meaning. Julian was Levertov's instructor in faith, and through her, she was able to confront what she called, what Levertov called her throbbing, stealthy cancer, her impediment to faith namely how a merciful God allowed the suffering of the innocent. From Julian, she learned that, the, that love was God's meaning, and that because of God's mercy and goodness, human freedom was not abrogated by God's intervention in the suffering world, even though God suffered when humans chose evil. Levertov had come a long way from the Mass of the Day of St. Thomas Didymus, in which she admonishes humans to shield the spark of divine life, lest it be extinguished. The focus here in the Julian poems was not on humans, but on God's loving action in and for the world. Through her engagement with the images given her in the creation of poems, Levertov overcame her theological conundrum. She wrote, as for my more substantial stumbling block, the suffering of the innocent and the consequent question of God's non-intervention, which troubles me less in relation to individual instances than in regard to the global panorama of oppression and violence, it was through poetry, through images given me by creative imagination while pondering this matter, that I worked through to a theological explanation which satisfied me. If her poems of the early uh, 1980s alluded to her faith, her later poems confirmed it. The poem Flickering Mind begins in dialogue with God. Lord, not you, it is I who am absent. She speaks of her secret joy of stealing alone to a sacred places, but then laments that her mind, unable to hold still, is like a darting minnow. It is she who is absent and eludes God's presence. In the poem, another poem, uh, entitled St. Thomas Didymus, she recognizes herself as twin, Didymus, obviously, meaning twin, of the man who begs Jesus to heal his son. Like him, she cries, I believe, help my unbelief. She is twin as well to Thomas the Doubter, and like him, she needs to put her hand into Jesus' wound. The revelation given her at that moment is not shame or pain, but of light 
streaming into her, unraveling the knot of unbelief that had bound her for so long. She writes, I witnessed my question, not answered, but given its part in the vast unfolding design lit by the rising sun. It was not argument of intellect, but the images of poetic imagination which enfaced Denise Levertov. Levertov explored, for instance, the courage of Mary in the poem Annunciation, and she challenges the stereotypic view of a passive Mary by rendering her as one free to accept or refuse God's announcement that she would conceive a son. Quote, call to a destiny more momentous than any in all times, she did not quail. Mary, the bravest of all humans, does not plead unworthiness or lack of strength, rather consent, courage unparalleled, opened her utterly. In another poem of awe and humility, Levertov addresses the one she calls you. We humans, dust motes in the cosmos, construct from the rubble of being our hope of you. But our metaphors shatter, unable to conceive the span of you. Yet we hunger to offer up our specks of life as fragile tesserae towards the vast mosaic, to be ourselves embedded in its fabric, as if once it were from that we were broken off. In 1993, four years before her death, Levertov published a volume entitled Evening Train. Train. She claimed that everything in that volume was a prayer. She wrote as well that, and I'm quoting here, writing poetry, that is receiving it, is a religious experience. At least if one means by that, that it is experiencing something that is deeper, different from anything that your own thought and intelligence can experience in themselves. Writing itself can be a religious act if one allows oneself to be part, to be put in its service. I don't mean to put, to make a religion of, of poetry, but certainly we can assume what poetry is not. It is definitely not just an anthropocentric act. The defining image of Evening Train is the unnamed mountain. She lived in, in sight of Mount Rainier in Seattle which she explores in its many guises. It was always real, commanding, a vast presence, seen, unseen, elusive, coming and going on the horizon. It was veiled, majestic, luminous, obdurate, unconcerned. It was massive, but ethereal, a vast whisper, perceived as a beckoning mirage. Portraying the mountain as presente and interpenetrated by spirit, Levertov searches for the spirit within, but she also analogizes the human relationship with the mountain as an encounter with God. This is possible because for her, imagination perceives analogies and extends them from the observed to the surmise. In the poem Morning Mist, the mountain is described as absent, much as God is Deus absconditus. It's a white stillness resting everywhere. In the poem Open Secret, <clears throat> she announces that the mountain is not known by close scrutiny, sense experience, or knowledge of its geology. Its power is in its open secret of its remote comings and goings, a lofty, lonely apparition. One's relationship with the mountain is not intimacy or communion, but awe. It speaks in a vast whisper. It is hidden sometimes in veils of cloud, much as the poet in veils of inattention, apathy, and fatigue is hidden from the mountain's witnessing presence. 
All that one needs to know is that the mountain is an angelic guardian blessing this city. Its absence is as necessary as silence is necessary to music. <clears throat> the final section of evening train contains poems with overt religious context to content. In the tide, she speaks of the ebb and flow of faith and of God, who she calls the giver. She asks, where is the giver whom my to whom my gratitude grows? In this emptiness, um, there seems no presence. Some poems contain specific biblical allusions. In contraband, she attributes the expulsion of humans from Eden to the fact that they have stuffed and gorged themselves on the contraband of toxic reason which separates them from God. Now, outside of Eden, God nonetheless squeezes through to them like filtered light, like a strain of music. Um, in her last poem, a book of poetry, that's the clue that we're coming to the end. In her last uh, book of poetry, Sands and Well contains poems of spiritual longing, including a few that have specific Christian foci. Um, in the conversion of Brother Lawrence, she tracks the dialogue of that Carmelite nun, uh, monk with God. In the midst of the drudgery of kitchen work, Lawrence, in joyful, steadfast attention to the presence of God, carries on an unending, silent, secret con conversation. The poem appears with the monk's words, let us enter into ourselves, time presses. In another poem, she writes of the hospitable silence of God, of an ultimate sifting of the rubbing of one's being to a finer substance, and then the floating into light, suspended, awaiting the common resurrection. Some of the most compelling poems of this uh, volume center on the notion of clinging and being held by God. In the poem, In the Beginning of Wisdom, she describes humans as so small, a speck of dust moving across the huge world, the world, a speck of dust in the universe, yet each person and the universe are held. In another, she claims that if one dares to believe, one floats, upheld, living in God's mercy. God's love is not mild or temperate, but a vast flood of mercy flung on resistance. Levertov conceived of poetry in her later years as witnessing to the double task to be and to arrive at being. This last intent is alluded to in Primary Wonder, the final poem of this final book of poetry. In this, she reiterates in poetic form her response to an interviewer's question, what is the most amazing thing about life? She responds, the mystery that there is anything, anything at all, let alone cosmos, joy, memory, everything, rather than the void, and that, O oh Lord, creator, hallowed one, you still, hour by hour, sustain it. Primary wonder, it had been there since the beginning, and it would now carry her through her final year of life. She continued to write poems which focused on the interaction between humans and the divine. These would be published posthumously. And of all of those, I think the most important is this poem called First Love that does, uh, defines Levertov's desire for secret communion. The poem opens with a child's failure to be in communion with another child, but then suddenly a flower opens. Okay, I, I wanted to, I know I've got to stop this, but, um, uh, oh, there's so much more here. Um, but I wanted to talk, of, uh, just at the end, to talk about, um, for a minute, um, what she's saying about poetry and play, prayer. Levertov is clear, I jumped seven pages or something, Levertov is clear that poetry like prayer derives from a primordial er language of wonder and awe. Both rely on receptivity, 
a capacity to receive the gift of inspiration or of grace, both begin with the ability to pay attention. Having read Simone Weil, I would imagine she resonated with her conclusion that paying attention to an object brings about a self-forgetfulness, a suspension of thought which leaves one available and empty. By redirecting one's energies away from self, one is brought into the presence of the other. For Levertov, poetry like prayer spurs communion between the self and the other. Both poetry and prayer are characterized by emptiness, absences, silences, spaciousness. The poem is sparse, takes up little space on the page. Prayer as well as a kind of empty space, a clearing. Poetry and prayer attempt to one degree or the other to name the ineffable through the use of analogy or metaphor. Imagination is a principal tool of engagement for both. Both feed the human spirit, give life, and offer possibilities of greater compassion. Both are vocational. Although um, Levertov appreciated these continuities, she was clear that the poet and what she referred to as the mystic were not identical. To her, the poet and the mystic differed both in their intent and in the consequence of that intent. The mystic, the one who prays, has as an object God and one's desire to love God. The mystic self-offering leads to transformation of the person. The poet, on the other hand, has as desire to come into the presence of the thing itself, to have that experience purified and transformed, and to express that experience in words. The mystic and the poet both desire transformation, but the former desires the transformation of one's life, the latter of her work. Um, and so she goes on to say that um, the, uh, the, the mystic and the poet are really quite different modes of being. The mystic may write beautifully, but that's just secondary and inessential. The mystic really strives to eliminate language. The poet, on the other hand, strives to make things out of language. Um, just as the mystic may happen to write well, so the poet may be a person of radiant virtue, virtue but that's merely incidental. Um, in the end, uh, Levertov gave a lecture her, uh, in a conference called Faith That Works. She changes her, the title of her remarks around and calls it Work That In Faiths. Um, and she, um, she talks about the fact that her poetry had really come to help her, to help in faith her. Um, Perhaps because in poem making, Levertov experienced in inhabitation, she could claim that in some instances her work was a prayer. Perhaps because of her profound sense of gratitude which poured from her when she wrote, she could claim that poem making could be a religious act. What she elaborates more fully, but unsystematically, is that poem making is also work that in faith. This neologism to in faith involves a process which strengthens the capacities for prayer, especially for paying attention, for receptivity, and for imagining, and enabled her to enter into and honor the mystery that is all um, there, that there is anything at all rather than the void, and that it is sustained. Poetry was Denise Levertov's way to deepen her experience of primary wonder, a wonder which was there in her beginning and in her end. Thank you. And apologies for going.